Good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're being joined by uh, many people at global launch events around the world, so welcome to all of them as well. Uh, we also have a live stream, and so a lot of folks are joining on the live stream, including Dinesh, I'm told. So welcome to everyone. Uh, this space used to be a power station for a chocolate factory in the 1900s. So we have transformed it pretty well, but I'm glad we have such a historic setting as we talk about what we are building for the future. At I.O. earlier this year, we talked about our vision for that future. We're at a seminal moment in computing. If you step back and think about it, computing has always had big shifts every 10 years or so. It all started in the 80s, early 80s, when the personal computer reached the mainstream. It was the first time computing touched the lives of many people, revolutionized the way they work. Roughly a decade later, in the mid-90s, the web arrived. It is arguably the biggest platform shift we have seen in our lifetimes. It brought the internet to many more people, radically changed industries, fundamentally changed how people interact and connect with each other. About 10 years later, in the mid-2000s, with the advent of smartphone, we had the mobile revolution. That brought computing to probably now around half the world's population. And it's profoundly changing people's lives. And the shift continues. In fact, when I look ahead at where computing is headed, it's clear to me that we are heading, evolving from a mobile-first to an AI-first world. What do I mean by that? In this world, computing will be universally available. It will be there everywhere in the context of a user's daily life. People will be able to interact with it naturally and seamlessly than ever before. And above all else, it will be intelligent. It will help users in more meaningful ways. At Google, we are very, very excited about this shift, and we've been working for a long time towards this shift. At the heart of these efforts is our goal to build a Google Assistant. We spoke about the Assistant earlier at Google I.O. this year. We envision the Assistant as a two-way conversation, a natural dialogue between our users and Google to help them get things done in the real world. The assistant will be universal. It will be available when the users need it to help them. And our goal is to build a personal Google for each and every user. Just like we built a Google for everyone, we want to build each user his or her own individual Google. We're just getting started, but in many ways, we've been working hard at this problem ever since Google was founded 18 years ago. We have invested in deep areas of computer science. Today, our knowledge graph has over 70 billion facts about people, places, and things, and, and we can answer questions based on that. Our natural language processing is what helps us make Google truly conversational with our users. And we have built state-of-the-art machine translation, image recognition, and voice recognition systems. And each of these areas is being turbocharged by the progress we are seeing with machine learning and AI. A few months ago, we captured the world's attention when DeepMind's AlphaGo won the World Go Championship against LaserDoll, one of the finest players of our generation. It showed the external world the moment for AI has arrived. But for us, the progress has been continuous, and, and the strides are huge. In fact, in the three months since AlphaGo played that game, we have had meaningful launches and how machine learning is impacting the products we build. Let me talk about three examples, all of which you know, we have talked about in the past three months since the AlphaGo moment. First, image captioning. Image captioning is how computers try to make sense of images they look at. And you know, we first launched our machine learning system in 2014, it was a state-of-the-art system, and our quality was around just over 89%. Our newer machine learning systems now, the quality is close to 94%. 4% may not sound like much to you, but first, 
it's really hard to increase quality at these levels because we are trying to approach human, uh, human level accuracy. And second, every single percentage point translates into meaningful difference for our users. So for example, if you take a look at the picture behind me, about two years ago, we used to understand this picture as a train is sitting on the tracks. Now, we understand the colors, so we describe it as a blue and yellow train is traveling down the tracks. Or if you look at this picture, two years ago, we understood it as a brown bear is swimming in the water. Now, we can count, our computing systems can count, so we understand this is two brown bears sitting on top of rocks. Advances like this is what helps us when you're in Google Photos find the exact pictures you're looking for and be a better assistant to you. Another example, machine translation. We've been doing machine translation for a while. And historically, our systems are statistics-based and we translate at a phrase-by-phrase -phrase level. So we translate individual phrases and combine them to form a translation. So if you look at this Chinese to English translation, you can see it makes sense, but it's not quite the way humans would translate it. Just recently, we announced our first end-to-end self-learning, deep learning machine translation systems. Rather than working at a phrase level, they take entire sentences and model sentences as outputs. And that's what you see in the middle. And you can see it is approaching human level translation. You can look at this quantitatively, and you know, we, we have a way to measure these things quantitatively. And if you look at our previous phrase-based system, it was quite far from the human system, and we closed a significant gap with our new machine learning systems. In fact, the progress for Chinese to English is so significant. Last week, we rolled it out in production, and so today, if you pick the Google Translate app, mobile app, and try to translate from Chinese to English, you're, you're using our newer machine learning systems. And the progress has been amazing. We'll literally translate billions of queries over the coming year. This is what will help us if a user in Indonesia is using, using the Google Assistant, we can find the right answer, even if it doesn't exist in their local language, translate it on the fly, and get it to them. Another example, text-to-speech. Text-to-speech is what we call when computers read something aloud back to you. So when you ask Google a question, who is the Prime Minister of Canada, we understand the text and try to make it as natural as possible for you. Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada. So this is text-to-speech. The way we do it today, we get a speaker into our recording studios, we record them for thousands of hours, we make them say short phrases and then combine them to be as natural sounding as possible. Again, deep learning is showing the way. DeepMind just published a paper with a new technology called WaveNet. It's a deep learning model where rather than modeling phrases, they actually model the underlying raw audio waves to generate a much more natural sound. You can again see the WaveNet model is getting much closer to human speech. To me, the reason this gets exciting is, today all we can do is a single voice for the assistant for all contexts. Doing this is what will enable us to have multiple voices, multiple personalities, get the assistant to differentiate between German and Swiss German, and one day even capture emotions when speaking to you. This is key to our vision for building an individual Google for each user. And more importantly, the assistant will continuously get better as we make progress with machine learning and AI. It is early days, but we are committed to this vision, and we are, working on it, we are going to work on it for a long time. But it's equally important to get the assistant in the hands of our users. And that's what today is about. In fact, we started doing it about two weeks ago with our new messaging app, Google Allo in which users can invoke the Google Assistant in group conversations. And the early reception has been great. They are interacting with it very naturally, asking us questions we expected, like, tell me a joke, but also questions we didn't expect, like, what is the meaning of life? So it's early days, 
but the assistant continuously learns from these experience and keeps getting better. If you remember, our vision for the Google Assistant is to be universal, to be there everywhere the user needs it to be, which is why today we are going to bring the Assistant to two new surfaces, one in the context of the phone, which you always carry with you, and one in the context of your home. To talk about the Google Assistant in, in new hardware products, let me invite Rick Costello, the head of our newly formed hardware group. Good morning, I'm Rick. It's an honor to be here today representing the hard work of so many of my colleagues. Well, I've been doing hardware for a long time, and even I smile like a kid every time I get to unbox a new gadget. Since I joined Google, one of the questions I get asked most often is, why should we build hardware? I mean, we often joke that building hardware is, well, hard. People have strong emotional connections to the products they rely on every day. They're an important part of our users' lives. But the rise of volume and complexity of all the information makes it so that this is the right time to be focused on hardware and software. Let's think about that for a moment. At the peak of film photography, 80 billion photos were captured every year. But last year, thanks to smartphones, one trillion photos, one trillion photos were taken. Communications has gotten similarly complex. 328 billion items were delivered by the post office last year. And that's compared to 50 trillion emails and mobile messages. And today, people want more than a thousand songs in their pocket. What they want is the entire world's music collection with them at all times. These informational changes mean that technology needs to be smart and just work for you. This is why we believe the next big innovation is going to take place at the intersection of hardware and software with AI at the center. That's where we have the biggest opportunity to bring people the very best of Google as we intended it. Building hardware and software together lets us take full advantage of capabilities like the Google Assistant. It lets us harness years of expertise we've built up in machine learning and AI to deliver the simple, smart, and fast experiences that our users expect from us. And it allows Google to be helpful to people wherever they need us, no matter what the context or form factor. As you'll see today, we're building hardware with the Google Assistant at its core, so you can get things done without worrying about the underlying technology. Our devices just work for you, whether you're at home with family, commuting to work, out for a jog, or spending time with friends. This is something that Google has always stood for. Hardware isn't a new area for Google, but now we're taking steps to showcase the very best of Google across a family of devices designed and built by us. This is a natural step, and we're in it for the long run. You're going to hear much more from our team in the coming months and years to come, and we have lots in store for you today. So let's get started. First, with phones. Phones are the most important device we own. They rarely leave our side. They're literally most people's lifeline to the internet and to each other. So today, I'm very excited to introduce you to a new phone made by Google. We call it Pixel. For those of you who follow Google for a while, that name might sound familiar to you. For us, it's always represented the best of hardware and software designed and built by Google. Let me tell you a little bit more about Pixel. We designed everything about Pixel from the industrial design to the user experience. Everything is simple and easy to use, something Google has always stood for. 
I really love how this phone looks and feels. The rear glass creates a bold, iconic element that gives Pixel personality and character. The polished aluminum case gives the phone a distinct look. And there's a subtle wedge from the top to bottom that keeps it thin where your hand most naturally grips it. And there's no unsightly camera bump. And while Pixel's beautiful, what really makes it come to life is how the hardware and software work together. It's the perfect example of how the best of Google smarts combines to make a great, simple user experience. So today, we're going to tell you about five things. First, we're excited to announce that Pixel is the first phone with the Google Assistant built in. Second is Pixel's terrific photography experience. Third is how we use Google Cloud so you never run out of space for those great photos. Fourth is how we let people talk to each other much more easily, no matter what operating system or device they use. And finally is how Pixel is made for mobile virtual reality. To tell you more about Pixel, I'd like to invite my colleague, Brian, to the stage. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brian, and I lead the software product management team for Pixel. There have been so many people who worked so hard, I feel lucky to be the one to show you what we've built. So this phone was designed inside and out to be simple and smart. And I think you'll notice that right from the home screen. Let's switch to a demo. The first thing you'll see with the new Pixel launcher is round icons, access to all of your apps, just to swipe away, and a clean, polished look. And like Rick said, Pixel is the first phone with the Google Assistant built in. Having the Assistant with you all through your day makes so many tasks incredibly easy. You can just touch and hold the phone's home button, or say the hot word, and the assistant jumps into action. Whether you're on your home screen or in any app, you can always ask your assistant for information or help with tasks. So let me show you how it works. Getting ready for today's launch, I've been spending a little bit more time at the office than usual. So I'm looking to plan something with family. And fall is such a great time in the Bay Area, I can get some ideas for the weekend with a long press of the home button and by saying, show me my photos from last October. Take a look at these pictures from your Google Photos. It's pretty cool, right? With a quick voice command, my assistant found just the right pictures from my Google Photos collection. And it doesn't just work with dates. You can search for people, places, and things, too. OK, so this concert at the Greek Theater at UC Berkeley it was pretty fun, so let's see what shows are coming up. Show me upcoming events at the Greek Theater in Berkeley. First Greek Theater events, the Lumineers, Borns and Rayland Baxter, the head of In the Heart and the tallest man on earth, Chance the Rapper, and Lauren Hill and Nas. So let's talk about what just happened there. Not only did the assistant recognize the venue I asked about, but it was able to serve up relevant information thanks to Google's knowledge graph. OK, it looks like the Lumineers are playing. I like their music, but I don't know if I've heard their latest stuff. Play me a song by the Lumineers. Playing music. Now, the assistant knows I like to listen to music on YouTube, so that's the app it opens up. Looks like that will be a pretty fun concert, but let's see if my wife even remembers who I am after three weeks of being MIA. <laughs> Text Lisa. Text Lisa Rokowski, sure. What's the message? Want to go see the Lumineers in Berkeley on Friday? Got it. Do you want to send it or change it? Send it. Okay. Message sent. 
Now, I just sent that message as an SMS, but the assistant also works with other messaging apps like WhatsApp and Viber, or I could have asked the assistant to call Lisa instead. So it looks like she responded. Thankfully, she wants to go, and she's recommending we get dinner at Marzano first. I haven't been there before, so let's try to get some more info. Now, watch this. The assistant can also help get information based on what's on my screen. So I'll do the same long press gesture on home and then swipe up to get contextually relevant information. So here's what just happened. The assistant recognized the restaurant in Lisa's text message and assembled all this useful information into a single card from the apps I have installed on the phone. I didn't have to say or type a single word. So let's get some more information from Google Maps. There's the location. Can swipe up, check out some pictures. OK, it looks pretty good, but let's see if it's close enough to the concert. How far is it from the Greek theater in Berkeley? If you drive, Marzano is 6.4 miles away from the Greek theater. Again, the assistant understood the context of my screen to answer my question. So it's a pretty quick drive. It will totally work. Let's get a reservation. Make a reservation at Marzano for Friday. Sure, let's make a reservation at Marzano with open table. How many people in your party? Two people. And what time do you want to reserve? 6 p.m. OK, I've completed the reservation, so you're all set. Look for an email confirmation from OpenTable with all the details. So that's just a glimpse of how the Google Assistant works. <laughs> it can help with the small things. But it's, it's help with the big things, like weekend plans, but it's also great for little things, like getting through your day, finding information, getting around, setting reminders for yourself, and so much more. The Assistant is incredibly useful when it's built right into your phone. And we'll show you how it works in other contexts later, too. The Google Assistant on Pixel is a great example of how hardware and software come together beautifully. Another is the camera. So there's actually an industry group, DxOMark, that rates camera quality in almost all popular DSLR and smartphone cameras on the market. These guys are just obsessed with cameras, lenses, and image quality. We're proud to report that Pixel received a rating of 89. That's the highest rating ever for a smartphone. So let me just put that score into context. This isn't only the best camera we've ever made. It's the best smartphone camera anyone has ever made. So how do we achieve this? Our teams of photography gurus and image processing experts have spent the last year designing and tirelessly optimizing the entire camera stack. Pixel has a 12.3 megapixel rear-facing camera and uh, featuring an f2.0 aperture and big 1.55 micron pixels to capture significantly more light than other cameras. The camera on Pixel is just excellent. Our amazing camera team has written some incredible on-device software algorithms that do things you just can't do with great hardware alone. For instance, Smart Burst is a feature that lets you capture just the right moment. By holding down the shutter button, you can capture a continuous stream of images and let Google Intelligence select the sharpest, clearest photo of just the right moment. And then there's HDR+. It's built to work in any light so you get clear, vivid pictures, even in challenging conditions. All the pictures you see here were taken on a pixel. Now, traditional cameras use a single long exposure in low light, but HDR Plus splits that into multiple short exposures, aligning them algorithmically and then combining each pixel. This technique reduces noise, minimizes blur, and gives you extended dynamic range, as in this example, preserving both the dimly lit people in the foreground and the beautiful sunset behind them. So HDR Plus clearly improves image quality. And with Pixel, the camera uses HDR Plus by default 
because there's zero shutter lag. That's a big deal. And it processes images twice as fast so you can keep shooting rapid fire. Now, just as important as capturing great photos is the speed of the camera app. We know this is really important. We don't want you to miss the moment while your camera gets itself ready. And I'm really proud to say that our camera has a shorter capture time than any smartphone camera we've tested, which makes action shots like this possible. And finally, my favorite feature, our incredible video stabilization. It means that videos turn out smooth, even if you're not. So let me tell you how this video is captured. We mounted two cameras side by side, hit record on each, and then started walking. The one on the left has video stabilization turned off, the one on the right has it on. Just look at the difference. This works by sampling the gyroscope at 200 times a second to figure out exactly how the camera is moving, even, even accounting for the rolling shutter and instantaneously compensating each part of the image so you can avoid that jello effect you see with other forms of image stabilization. Of course, Pixel comes with Google Photos built in. So once you've captured the moment with Pixel's powerful camera, Google Photos helps you store, organize, and share all your photos, no matter how goofy they might be. We think people are going to use this camera a lot. So as a special bonus for Pixel owners, we're including free, unlimited storage for photos and videos at original quality. That's all your photos and videos at full resolution, including the rich 4K videos you can take with this phone. So with Pixel, you'll never run out of space for your mountains. And you can say goodbye to those painful storage full pop-ups. So that was a quick intro to the Google Assistant on Pixel and our new best-in-class camera integrated with Google Photos. Now I'd like to invite Sabrina up to share some more great features of Pixel. But before that, let's watch this new spot from our upcoming campaign. I'm Sabrina, and I work with Brian on the Pixel product management team. At Google, we've always taken pride in creating things that are both smart and simple. So we've thought a lot about the different features that make your phone work for you. I can't wait to share just a few of them with you now. First, let's talk about communications. Whether your friends are on Android or iOS, Google Duo, our new video calling app, lets you jump into a call with just a single tap. And it comes pre-installed on Pixel. My favorite feature in Duo is called Knock Knock. It shows you a live video stream of the person calling you before you pick up. So you can see who's calling and even what they're doing. As you can see, my son likes to have fun with this feature. Now, let's talk about something I know you all really care about, the battery. We spent a lot of time optimizing Pixel to be smart about improving battery life. We made sure you can easily get through your day. But for the times when you need a quick charge, like when you're about to head out to dinner and you realize your phone has literally no power left, Pixel can get you up to seven hours of power with just 15 minutes of charging. So you can be on your way. And of course, Pixel ships with the newest Android operating system, Nougat. Pixel users will get system and security updates as soon as they're available directly from Google. We've also made the update process easier. When a new update is available, it will be downloaded and installed in the background. This means the next time you restart your phone, you'll instantly be using the new version. We just take care of it for you. Gone are the days of staring at a progress bar while waiting for an update to install. We also want to make sure 
you feel supported when you're using Pixel. So we've built 24-7 live customer care right into the phone. You can reach a Google support agent over phone or chat. And to make it easier for them to understand and help solve your pro the problem, we've added a screen share option. So you can let the agent see what you're seeing. Now that we've given you all these reasons to switch to Pixel, we've also made it super simple to transfer over everything you really care about. We know historically it's been hard to switch from one OS to another. So we've built a new tool to let you quickly and easily transfer your contacts, photos, videos, music, texts, calendar appointments, and your iMessages. We even put a quick switch adapter in every box. We're also excited to introduce a brand new range of cases and accessories for Pixel. These include a new artworks collection of our live cases with custom designs from top artists such as Fail and photographers like Gray Malin and Chris Hadfield. Finally, Pixel comes in two sizes, a 5-inch and a 5.5-inch display. All the great features you've heard about today work on both. And both of these sizes come with all of these amazing hardware specs. Pixel is available in three colors, descriptively named quite black, very silver, and a limited edition, really blue. So let's recap the highlights. Pixel is the first phone to ship with the Google Assistant built in. It has the best smartphone camera. It includes unlimited storage for all your photos and videos. It comes with Duo pre-installed. Plus, it's the first phone to be Daydream VR ready. You'll be hearing more about VR shortly. Now, where can you get this stuff? Here in the US, we're teaming up exclusively with Verizon to bring Pixel to the market. We're proud to work with them again. We're also excited to be working with many international partners to bring Pixel to the world. Additionally, Pixel will be available unlocked on the Google Store. And for you Project Fi fans out there, you'll be happy to know that Pixel is the latest device to work on the Project Fi network. Pixel starts at $649 or $27 a month on the Google Store here in the US. It's available for pre-order starting today in the US, Australia, Canada, Germany, and the UK, and in India starting on October 13th. So that's the new Pixel, the first phone made by Google inside and out. Next up is Clay, who will talk to you about VR. But before that, Here's a recap of all the newness of Pixel. Hi, I'm Clay. 
I lead the virtual reality team at Google, and I'm really excited to get to show you some of the things that we've been working on. Just to say it, we love virtual reality. For us, it's not just a technology. It's not just another screen. It's something that we believe is going to be important because unlike anything else we've seen, it can put you someplace else. It's transporting. Uh, with VR, you can put on some goggles and feel viscerally like you're in another world. It's richer. It's far more immersive. And we believe it will impact how we explore, how we work, how we play, and how we learn. But to create this sense of immersion, it takes some powerful technology. And my team's goal is to make that technology simpler and friendlier and more accessible. And we've been hard at work doing just that with Daydream, our platform for high-quality mobile virtual reality. Now, Daydream ties together a bunch of things that you need for great VR, software optimizations, specs for phones, headsets, and controllers, and then the apps and experiences themselves. And all of this in service of creating a healthy VR ecosystem with our partners and with developers. And today we've got news in all of these areas. Let's start with phones. So you just heard about the new Pixel phones, and they are great phones. And as Sabrina said, we've made them great for VR, too. We've tuned everything from their sensors to their displays. And the Pixel phones, which are the first, which are daydream ready, as we call it. Now, of course, you need some extra hardware to unlock the phone's VR capabilities. So let's talk about the VR headset. Now, the headset is important to get right. I mean, after all, it's something that you wear on your head. But we looked out there and we saw some problems. We saw issues with comfort. We saw stuff that's pretty hard to use, pretty complicated. And everything just kind of looked the same. So we looked at all this, and we had some ideas. And we have a bit of a different take on the VR headset. And so I'd like to introduce you to Daydream View. It's the first Daydream-ready VR headset. Now, if you're into VR, I'll just say that the specs are there. It has a nice field of view. And with the Daydream phone, low latency and really accurate head tracking. But we didn't just look at the specs. We obsessed over the details of the design. We wanted to make something that's comfortable and really easy to use. We also thought about how you could make it your own. So first, let's talk about comfort, how it feels, how it fits. Well, you'll notice immediately that it doesn't quite look like other VR headsets. And that's because in designing it, we weren't inspired by gadgets. We looked at what do people actually wear. We wear stuff that's soft, stuff that's flexible and breathable. And so we crafted our headset out of that same comfortable stuff. Fabrics, soft microfiber, and other materials that you'd, you'd find in clothing and athletic wear. In fact, we worked with clothing designers and makers to get the design just right. And the result is something that's soft and cozy and feels great to wear. So the materials are really nice. It's also lightweight, 30% lighter than similar devices. And one other thing, to see comfortably, some people need some help, people like me. And so we made sure that the headset fits nicely over eyeglasses. So that's comfort. Next, let's talk about making it easy to use. Now, to start, it's got to be easy to get into VR. You don't want to think about cables and wires and lots of little clicky things and connectors that you have to get just right. All that stuff just kind of gets in the way. Really, you just want to pop your phone in and be in VR. And that's the way Daydream View works. You open the latch, you drop your phone in, you close the latch, and you're ready to go. That's it. The headset and phone say hello wirelessly, so there's nothing to connect. And the headset includes an auto alignment system that gets everything just right. So getting into VR is easy. We wanted interacting with VR to be easy too. And that's where the Daydream controller comes in. Now, the controller is really important because when you go someplace, you want to be able to do things there. So let's have a look. It's really easy to use. At the top is a clickable touchpad, a couple of buttons. But there's more to it than meets the eye. Hidden inside are a bunch of sensors that respond to how you move. So you can point, you can swing, you can aim. It's so precise that you can draw with it. You can write your name. So it's really powerful, and we'll have a look at some of the things you can do with it in just a second. 
Okay, now what do you do with a controller after you use it? You lose it. You lose it. You lose it in the couch or in the bottom of your bag. And we didn't want that to happen. So the controller has a home inside the headset. When you're done, it just kind of snuggles in there like this. And it's details like these that we worked hard to get right. These little things. These little things. It's also, it's very well built. These little things that make the whole experience easier and more seamless. So let's talk about the last problem, everything kind of being the same. We wanted you to be able to make it yours. And that starts with phones. So the Pixel phones are the first daydream-ready phones, again. And the headset obviously works great with them. But there are a lot of other daydream-ready phones on the way from our partners, too. And the headset will work with them as well. And one last thing. Things we wear don't come in just one color. And we didn't see why a VR headset should either. So with Daydream View, you'll be able to choose your color. At launch, we'll have slate. And later this year, we'll add two other colors, snow and crimson. So that's Daydream View, a comfortable, easy to use VR headset that you can make your own. Now, of course, what really matters here is what you can do. And there's a lot to show you. And for that, I'd like to invite up Adrian McAllister, our Director of Partnerships. Adrian. <laughs> Thanks, Clay. Hi, everyone. My name is Adrian, and I lead VR Partnerships for Daydream. The team has been working closely with our partners to bring some incredibly immersive experiences to Daydream. And I'd like to share just a few of them with you today. With Daydream, you're going to be able to explore some really magical places. And what's more magical than the wizarding world of J.K. Rowling? I'm excited to announce that we've been working with Warner Brothers to bring an exclusive Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them experience to Daydream. In it, you're a wizard, and the controller transforms into a wand that you can use to levitate objects and cast spells. We're really stoked about this, because don't we all just want to be wizards? We're also really excited to bring some great educational experiences to Daydream. One out of this world example, we've been working with makers of Star Chart, an app that lets you explore the solar system and learn all about the constellations. With Star Chart on Daydream, it's like having your own personal planetarium where you can fly through the stars and explore new galaxies. The stars are also an epic place for space battles, and Daydream is going to be a stellar place for games. We're excited about Gunjack 2 from CCP, the makers of EVE. In it, you're in the cockpit of a spaceship where you're defending the fleet against alien ships. You can look all around and then use the controller to aim the ship's lasers anywhere you want to blast those alien ships. Back on Earth, for when you want to kick back on the couch and watch something, we've been working with the likes of Netflix, HBO, and Hulu to bring their entire entertainment libraries to Daydream. In VR, you can see it all on the big screen and bring that big screen with you wherever you go. When you want to turn your attention to current events, the New York Times has been doing important work in VR documentary and news. They've told us stories that put us alongside soldiers and refugees. In VR, you see the world from their perspective. It's powerful journalism brought into virtual reality. These are just a handful of the experiences that are going to be available. Over 50 partners are bringing apps and games to Daydream before the end of the year, and there are hundreds more on the way. To complement our partners, we're also bringing the best of Google to Daydream. First, there's Google Play Movies, with their library of shows and films which you can watch on your own big screen. Then, there's Google Photos, where you can relive your personal memories in a completely immersive way. And then, there's Street View and YouTube. Let's take a look. With Street View and Daydream, you can visit thousands of places in 70 different countries. And we've built 150 curated tours of the world's most amazing places, so you can feel what it's like to tour the Taj Mahal. There are also some hidden gems in Street View. 
For instance, you can visit the Faroe Islands and see their beautiful rolling fields from the perspective of a sheep, or as our Faroe Island friends like to refer to it, sheep view. And finally, there's YouTube. YouTube on Daydream is amazing. To start, you can access the entire library of YouTube videos, regular videos, and watch them on a cinema-sized screen. Your favorites on YouTube have never looked better or bigger. But where the YouTube experience really shines is with 360 and VR videos, where you're not just watching a film, you're in the film. Here's one of my favorites from the London Museum of Natural History. You're standing in the hall of the museum, looking all around when all of a sudden, dinosaurs come back to life right in front of you. I don't think he's done yet. In virtual reality, he looks even hungrier. It's just one of the hundreds of thousands of immersive videos on YouTube. And we're working with YouTube's creators to bring even more original VR content in the months to come. So that's just a glimpse of what's coming to Daydream from our partners and from Google. With that, I'd like to turn it back to Clay. Thank you. So that's the update on Daydream. The first Daydream ready phones with the Pixel, a headset that's really comfortable a controller that's powerful and easy to use, and so much to experience. Now, all of this will come together in November, when Daydream View and the controller go on sale together for $79. So there it is, our next step in making high-quality VR accessible to everyone. We're really excited about it. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Mario.